the the physics of of, uh, of fiber optics um, is really has a lot of subtleties, um, and so. Um, the we're trying to present some of the basics one of the things that uh, for example um uh the bend tolerance of these fibers so they keeping that light in the in the, there's been a lot of advances to fiber technology in terms of keeping the light in the fiber and so you'll see that you can buy cables with different bend tolerances and that has implications in many ways another thing that you you, you notice if you look carefully and you get bounty points if you notice this actually is that uh, the speed of light is a function of the index of refraction and scott told us that the index of refraction uh, it, 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 it's like essentially an integral refraction, but also it's a, it's a function of the wavelength. And that's why prisms work. They, they split into rainbows. And so actually the speed of the Stokes and anti-Stokes light is different. And so when you come back and we say, hey, look at this nice Stokes, anti-Stokes ratio, what had to happen to get there is they had to adjust the time of arrival to account for the different velocities. And all instruments do that, hidden to you, you hope. But when you start to see funny artifacts, you say, well, where did that artifact come from? How come my, all my little spikes turn into S-shaped spikes? And that's if you get those two velocities wrong. So what I want to just kind of emphasize with respect to what Scott just um, told you is that one of the roles of CTEMPS is to help you over these problems. If you run into some weird artifacts, let us know. We've seen them before. And we will try to help you, first off, make choices early on that avoid those artifacts, but also help you identify what's going on. And so I want to talk in that vein about some practical matters in applying DTS. Um, and so the first thing you have to do is power your instrument up. And I think it was Kristen who said, hey, we didn't have a plug, which I'm glad she noticed that before she went all the way to that atoll. And so they made provisions for power in terms of getting solar panels and batteries. And so when you design these systems, you have to have not only um, sufficient power, but it has to be clean. The lasers in these devices can be very sensitive. And for example, the CTEMPS uh, Ultima from Celixa, uh, when a uh, pulse uh, of, of energy to that uh, instrument can cost us several thousand dollars in a broken uh, laser. So watch out. Um, what we also talk about here in a moment is the choice of cables. And we saw from Solifos how the, the cable and real, uh, actually the, the fiber itself is the sensor. So the choice of cables is very important. Um, and it, we'll talk about that a little bit more here, as well as the choice of instruments. And I want to talk to you a little bit about these specifications. And again, I appreciate that, uh, that the representatives gave some indication of how these um, uh, specifications work, but we need to look at those a little more carefully. And finally, field repairing. Imagine you're, you're, you're trying to string something that's the thickness of a, of, a, of a strand of your hair through the field, something bad might happen. And so at, at CTEMPS, we always encourage you to take not just the cable and the connectors that you think you need, but the ability to have backup repair kits to correct for any damage that might occur, whether it be in the middle of a cable where you have to splice the cable again or put on a new uh, connector. Okay, now the cable uh, protection um, is super important. And the point is, and remember Scott showed you that picture about the, 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 the going around the poles in the, um, in the snow installation. So anything that impinges on the cable, and that could create a micro bend or a macro bend, but the micro bends basically overcome the index of refraction break and so that the light can escape and what it's always trying to do. So that when you have a, a micro impingement, that will lead to attenuation, but not only will it lead to attenuation, the blue shifted light gets out more uh, aggressively than there's the red shifted light. So it changes your ratio. If only they both escaped with the same amount, it wouldn't cause us any concerns at all. What we actually find is that the ratio of the two lights leaving at a given impingement are different. So therefore, unless it's corrected for, all of your temperatures will be erroneous from that point forward. So you really have to take that seriously. Um, and so we go to our cable manufacturers and say, give us some really, really well-protected um, uh, 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 cable. Now, you'll hear of two, two terms, tight, buffer, tight buffering and loose buffering, or loose tube. Tight buffering is when they actually inject the plastic jacket over the fiber with no airspace. And so basically there is a mechanical point, a uh, line of connection between the exterior and the, and the glass itself. Tight buffering is often used in telecommunications applications. Why is that? Because in telecommunications, they don't really care about the amplitude of the signal. 
they are sending down packets of pulses. And as long as they can see the ones and zeros, they're happy. We have much higher need for um, uh, uh, quality of signal. That 1% change in signal level is, 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 is disastrous for us. Therefore, watch out for cables that are fine for telecommunications, but not so great for us. Um, tight buffering can be used, and particularly if you have the aerial deployments, we have used tight buffered cables. Um, if you use the, uh, the bend tolerant and, and do all sorts of other tricks, you can get it to work, but it is a challenge. Loose tube constructions are preferred construction where the fiber is sitting inside of a capillary tube, usually one to three millimeters, sometimes as little as 0.8 millimeters. And it's often filled with a hydrophilic um, gel that's water absorbing um, and so that, uh, and it will scavenge hydrogen. Hydrogen, if it enters the fiber, what happens is the fiber, when we talked about the, the two indices of refraction that creates the bend in the light, actually that's not quite the case. What they, we often use now are what are called graded index, where they have diffused in material into the glass. So there's a gradual change in index of refraction. This has lots of great optical advantages. However, if hydrogen gets into the system, the hydrogen counteracts that index of refraction change. And therefore there's no index of refraction change and therefore you lose all your light. And that's a cable going dark in the in terminology of the field. So the hydrogen scavenging is especially important if you're working in the hydrocarbons industry. Uh, where that's a, a, a ubiquitous. But in any case, whenever you have a fiber that is bare, you need to protect it. So don't, uh, so that's why when you do a splice in the field, you will protect that um, uh, cable. Now here um, are some of the, the, the types of, of, of armoring that are used to protect these things. And what you'll see is that we have this corrugated armoring in, in several of these cables. These, this is a very bulky, not very flexible armoring. There's some really interesting um, spun uh, stainless steel strip armoring, where it's literally just a, a strand of stainless steel banded around it to make a tube shape. Very flexible, but also not as resistant to micro bending as, as, as a full stainless steel tube shown here, where they've literally taken a piece of stainless steel a foil, wrapped into a circle, and welded it around the fiber. It's a really remarkable process. It was actually patented um, uh, by a company out of Reno, Nevada, and uh, is used for making the hypodermic syringe needles that will give us all um, injections of, of, of uh, vaccine very soon. But in any case, um, the, uh, the protection of the fiber comes in many flavors, and each one has its advantages in terms of flexibility or in terms of, of the, uh, the resilience to, to any impingement. Okay. Now, the other thing that about these cables that I mentioned earlier is that if the fiber gets any tension on it, that's gonna change its attenuation. And guess what? The blue lights can be attenuated more. So if you had a cable where the fiber experienced changing load, that can be either compressive or expansive, that will give you time varying calibration coefficients. Oh boy, do we not like to see that? And oh boy, do we see that often? So watch out, this is actually a serious issue. So what happens is they're going to put in some strengthening fibers in this case, uh, shown here, or you can use strengthening uh, steel. What they've done is they've overstuffed, put a little bit of extra fiber into the cable so that up to a certain amount of tensile stress, the fiber experiences no stress. It's not when the cable breaks that you're in trouble. It's probably a factor of 100 before it breaks that you're in trouble. And that's when you have stretched the strengthening fibers sufficiently. So now the fiber itself is, is experiencing tension. So um, the, when you see the specs and you see it says um, working tension versus uh, um, uh, rupture tension, they can be different by a factor of 100. And you don't think that just because you're not breaking the cable that you're getting good data. Okay. Now, the industry long ago, before Scott and I were uh, involved, and that is a long time now, um, chose to use the E2000 connector. The E2000 connector is really great in many ways. It has this little flap door over the end so that only when it's inserted is the glass exposed to the other side of the connector. So when you have it pulled out, you do not have a direct optical path where you can look at the actual fiber. And any of you who, who played with these things, um, you will know that if you take a piece of black tape and put it over the end of the fiber optic emitter, uh, over the end of the cable like on the glass itself, you will burn that black tape. So although everyone says that this, um, this uh, lasers are low power, it's true, 
but it's only true to a point. If you were to look at this fiber, uh, particularly with magnification, uh, you could uh, destroy your vision. So having a flap door is lovely, but the flap doors often fall off and then they can either fall off inside of your instrument or fall off somewhere unknown to you and they'll never be going back on. If anything bad like that should happen, you simply have to start over, cut the connector off, reattach a fresh pigtail, we call it. Now, the glass we're using is very run of the mill, multi-mode glass for the most part, but the way the glass is terminated is unlike what is typically done for telecommunications. We use an angle polish, an angle uh, polished end on it, not a vertical end on the cable. And what that means is that back, the back uh, scatter, uh, back reflection in the Raman spectrum is bounced out of the fiber. This is really important because that'll otherwise contaminate our signals. So when you order your pigtails, watch out, use the angle polished APC um, uh, uh, finish on the fiber. And that's not normal and you have to ask for that. Um, now the E2000s furthermore, and this is some data from a while ago in the right corner, where we saw an artifact that was up to 0 0.6 degrees, 0 0.8 degrees of a temperature shift at the connector when the plastic uh, E2000 was heated and cooled. So we have an E2000 in, a, in a, a barrel connector, heat it and cool it. And what happens is you get an artifact that shows up in time. And what's going on is this is a, this is a mechanical connection supported by plastic and plastic has its thermal properties are quite dynamic with temperature change. And therefore, when you change the force of compression and the force of contact, you change the transmission characteristics and specifically, we lose more blue light than red light. And so we get a temperature artifact at the E2000. What does that say? Do not put E2000s after your calibration baths. You have calibration baths and no more E2000s. From that point on, you must use fusion splicing. Now, there are a ton of different types of spools and spool out uh, uh, approaches. In the lower left, I show an electrically driven spool that we've used a lot. It's uh, very handy for this particular cable, which weighs over a thousand kilograms. And we can drive the cable in and out on um, with a DC variably uh, speeded motor. But the little um, platform uh, device that's kind of shown at the mid lower right um, with yellow and red, uh, this is an extremely handy way to play, pay out cable as well. Watch out for the horizontal payout. This is acceptable if the cable is really well wound. If you have cable that has been poorly wound onto the spool, what will happen if it's mounted in this position is it'll fall over itself and you get tangles. Once a cable crosses and gets a kink in it, you've just ruined your cable. So um, be very careful when you're paying out or taking in cable that you look out for any opportunity for a kink to form. That would be a loop that you pull tight, like your garden hose that stops flowing water. Imagine if every time you pulled your garden hose and had stopped flowing water, that you had to pay someone $10,000. That's kind of what we're talking about. So don't let there be kinks. You have to really watch out as you're paying out and, and drawing back cable that those are fully avoided. Now, with respect to the resolution um, in, of temperature, what we see is that we're really counting photons. So when we hold our, our, our instrument open for a minute of, of collection, it's getting a rate of, of, of photon collection. The uncertainty of the mean rate of collection of photons goes with the square root of time. And this is from standard statistical, um, you know, uh, large number uh, uh, kind of uh, concepts. And what we see, and this is looking at the temperature resolution as obtained from a DTS as a function of one over the square root of the measurement time. Longer the measurement time, the better the, the temperature resolution. So long measurement times are close to zero in this one. It is very linear. So the central limit theorem works. And you want to be, this is how, you, when you take a one second measurement, it will be roughly 10 times more accurate than a hundred second measurement. Okay. When we talk about spatial resolution, and you'll hear people interchangeably use spatial sampling and spatial resolution, and those people, of course, lose brownie points in this class for sure, because you can sample along a cable as often as you want, but that doesn't mean that your instrument is able to distinct, distinct, distinguish between where photons came from that accurately. So typically, you will, a well-designed instrument will sample at twice this, the um, resolution that its actual spatial, its full spatial resolution is, 
because of the Nyquist uh, um, theorem for, for noise. So essentially here we're looking at data from a, a Selixa Ultima and the samples are separated by 12 and a half centimeters. But to go, oh, this is a, a fiber that went from a cold place to a very hot place over 800 degrees C. And so what we see is that the transition in temperature from a 10% change towards the new temperature to a 90% change to the new temperature took 29 centimeters. So we were sampling on 12 and a half centimeters, but that what's referred to as the spatial resolution here is quoted as 29 centimeters. Is it really 29 centimeters? No, because we're already contaminated at 10, at, at, at 45.2 centimeters, uh, meters along this cable, we're already seeing a deviation from the true temperature that, that cable is at. The temperature transition happened right around 45.35, uh, but we're seeing an impact of that down the way. Why is that? That's because photons traveling down this fiber are going on paths of different lengths, for one thing. And so they actually have dispersion. So the longer the cable, the greater the dispersion. Also, the instrument has a windowing um, uh, a shutter essentially, and how quickly that shutter opens and closes it tells you how, how um, well you can distinguish things in space. So watch out for the definition of spatial resolution and this 90% rule. When you get a reported value back on your instrument, what it, and we'll call that at position zero on this fiber here, what it's really doing is centering a Gaussian of collected photons that came from the left and the right of that location. So the bulk of the photons, the highest number of photons came right from your, the, the reported location, but photons were actually contributing to this measurement that were from earlier and later along the cable. So you're always looking at a spatial um, weighted sum of the temperature along a section. And it's gonna be roughly equal, a section roughly equal to, so let's say two times the, the spatial resolution. Where Got one at? more minute, John. Okay. Um, when they report temperature resolution, we have a resolution of, 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 of 0.1 degrees, they're gonna take 20 points along a line and average them and see what the standard deviation is. These all come together in the specs. And what companies will do is, is report these swaths of, of, of specs. And what you'll find is that all these different color lines actually um, come down to the same thing when you look at uh, the equations we presented thus far. So watch out, um, these curves are all really reflecting Beer's law, and the law of large numbers, and that's about it. So watch out for highly variable attenuation. Be careful um, about what you need with respect to the stresses that you might experience at that site. Understanding the true meaning of temporal and spatial resolution in the DTS case is important if you're gonna make uh, accurate interpretation of these data. And always collect data at higher temporal and spatial resolution than you think you'll need and expect a post-process where it's very easy to average in time and average in space, but you will never pull them back apart. So with that, I thank you and um, we look forward to the more interesting presentations and I really appreciate everyone's uh, excellent work uh, contributing to this um, today. You bet. Thank you, John. Great. Okay, a um, couple of questions. I just see one uh, for John. Uh, how would you avoid getting a temperature artifact at the E2000 connector under field conditions, high and low temperatures? Is this taken care of when calibrating using controlled temperature baths? Exactly. So you, you beyond your last E2000, let's say that's at your instrument itself, of course, then you would put a calibration point. And that calibration point is gonna have a bunch of cable, enough to get a good average, and a very accurate thermometer. And that's what we call a calibration point. Post calibration point, then there should be no more connectors downwind of this, okay? If there are connectors, then there are, we've written papers and, and that tell you a little bit of some, some hopeful ways of maybe correcting for them. I think Mark Hausner wrote a, a nice paper on that, um, but it's, it's, it's really a jungle out there. So try to avoid the E2000s in your measurement domain. I think I think we will hear as we're talking calibration today. When we hear from Bart, we'll we'll see some ways to get around some of those issues when we do what's called a double-ended measurement, where we where we begin to uh, 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 correct for attenuation, differential attenuation that is spatially variable on the on the optical fiber and can change in time. But it does avoid avoid connections if you can. John is exactly right. Okay, this is a place where we just one last point. 
belts and suspenders. So I don't know how many of you are wearing both belts and suspenders today, but the point is that you cannot have too many reference temperatures or too many protections against potential failings. We always run into unexpected situations with our installations. The more independent um, temperature measurements you have, the greater the likelihood you will be able to make good use of your data.